1950, roughly by my calculation, was in the North Atlantic region, meaning Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Now it's 13% of the literate world. 60% of world output was in the North Atlantic region. Now it's 33% at purchasing power prices. 53% of all urban residents were in the North Atlantic world in 1950. Now it's 14%. The world's converged. Urban, literate, technologies have spread. Adam Smith was right that trade was actually the fundamental carrier of this. It was when China opened up that the acceleration of technological change came so fast to China. It was Japan that invented this process of rapid infusion of technology in the Meiji Restoration in 1868, and then again after World War II in its rebuilding. So we now see that Asia and the North Atlantic regions have crossed paths, again, using Madison's data updated by IMF data. Uh, the North Atlantic was the dominant power until uh, this gap started to close in 1950. And by around 2010, Asia is now larger than the North Atlantic region. This is the real change of the world. We know that the BRICS, even before the recent expansion to six more countries, were already larger than the G7. That's a transformed world. And China, of course, overtook the US in GDP measured at purchasing power parity around 2014. But China is still much poorer per capita, maybe a third, but with more than four times the population. So this is the reason that China is a larger economy. So I want to argue very briefly that we're in a new age, a new age which I call the age of sustainable development. We're there in part because the scale of economic activity and a population 10 times the size of when Thomas Robert Malthus wrote The Principles of Population in 1798, which was then about 900 million people and today 8 billion people, now has put so much pressure on the physical environment that we are in urgent need of global public response to climate, biodiversity destruction, loss of ecosystem functions, and so forth. And the world adopted goals addressed to this. It's fitfully trying to achieve them. Today at the UN, this very day, is the midpoint review of the sustainable development goals. They're way off track. Nice objectives not being achieved, mainly because the United States and other rich countries don't care at all about it. Uh, and so the world governance is not organized to achieve these goals at this point. But these goals are the real global goals and needs. So we have a very perilous moment because we have arrived at multipolarity. And as Adam Smith talked about, that balance of awe and equality of force to create justice, that's a delicate, difficult transformation. And just to say, there are several different theories of what's going on right now. Robert Kagan, uh, whom you may know is our chief uh, neocon ideologue, and the uh, husband of our uh, acting uh, Deputy Secretary of State, Victoria Newland, uh, believes uh, that American hegemony uh, must rule and will continue to rule. Otherwise, the jungle will grow back, as he says. Uh, wow. Uh, Henry Kissinger says uh, that we need a balance of power theory. Balance of power is OK, except it becomes imbalanced. Uh, and it's extremely difficult to manage. And when Bismarck was uh, thrown out by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, it was the end of Europe's balance of power. And World War I came in response when Bismarck's genius at balancing was lost. Uh, John Mearsheimer says we are inevitably in tragedy. That's just the nature of great power politics. Mearsheimer is extremely uh, intelligent, predictive, an extremely nice person, but, it, but tragic to read because he says that conflict is 
inevitable. I don't buy it. Uh, now, another theory of, uh, that I read uh, 50 years ago of a uh, wonderful uh, professor of mine also, Charles Kindleberger, uh, said we need a hegemon. So if it's not the US or Britain, it's got to be someone else like China. I don't buy that either. Uh, but this is a brilliant book. Boy, it led to a uh, lot of late night discussions uh, over the next 50 years. Um, Graham Allison says, uh, as with Sparta and Athens, uh, we're prone for war, not inevitable, but uh, the war trigger is very high because of the rise of China. And my little contribution is, could we get our heads together and address global public goods and avoid global public bad? So, I argue that we need a rational approach, not a tragic approach, and that it is not beyond us to reach the cooperative corner of the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, in other words, we can understand the game, we can understand the risks of defection, but we can understand the benefits of cooperation, and so we should be able to reach that cooperative outcome. So I would argue that we need a new geopolitics and a new ethics of sustainable development. I often refer to President Kennedy's inaugural address when he said, the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. So what hangs in the balance is something extraordinary. We could achieve SDG 1, end poverty, or we could blow up the world. And what is absolutely incredible is how this is in the hands of a very few people. That's what's incredible. And by the way, my takeaway from Oppenheimer was what a bunch of geniuses that invented the bomb and what a bunch of dolts who use it or decide about using it. This is our paradox. It took the greatest geniuses of the age to understand nuclear fission and how this uh, could be created, and then it fell into the hands of uh, the everyday uh, person who might not have the imagination to keep us away from global disaster. That's technology, by the way. Technology is often created by geniuses and used by all of us, uh, and uh, that is the real issue that uh, Plato was wondering about already in the Republic uh, 2,350 years ago. How do you make the rulers uh, know what to do? He said you have to raise them from birth for that purpose. So there are crucial. The fact of the matter is that the US grand strategy, uh, if we can use that term of the grand strategists of uh, the US uh, state, see our grand strategy in the United States as being dominance. And I often refer to a, an article that I think is very clear, uh, uh, succinct, uh, and revealing by a former colleague of mine at, at Harvard University, Robert Blackwell, uh, an esteemed ambassador of the United States, who wrote in 2015, and I'll, I'll quote from the article, since its founding, the United States has consistently pursued a grand strategy focused on acquiring and maintaining preeminent power over various rivals, first on the North American continent, then in the Western hemisphere, and finally globally. Well, China doesn't want the United States to be the preeminent power. It wants to live alongside the United States. Blackwell, writing in 2015, uh, said China's rise is a threat to U.S. preeminence. And he laid out a series of steps that the Biden administration actually is following almost step by step. What Blackwell laid out already back in 2015 is that the United States should create, quote, new preferential trading arrangements among U.S. friends and allies to increase their mutual gains through instruments that consciously exclude China. There should be a technology control regime to block China's strategic capabilities, a buildup of, quote, power political capacities of U.S. friends and allies on China's periphery. 
and strengthen U.S. military forces along the Asian rimland, despite any Chinese opposition. This has become the Biden foreign policy. China knows it. China really is pushing back. But what's very important and interesting to understand, and we've seen it clearly in the dynamics involving the Ukraine war, most of the world also does not want the U.S. as the as the, the global preeminent power, most of the world wants a multipolar world and do, is therefore not lined up behind the United States sanctions on Russia and so forth. And this was also the message of President Lula visiting China, saying to President Xi Jinping, we as Brazil also want multipolarity, true multipolarity, and we want peace, for example, in the Russian-Ukraine war that is based on not a U.S. perception of dominance, say, NATO enlargement, but rather a peace that reflects a multipolar world. This is real. It's happening all over the world. And the, the fact of the matter is, the reason why this is a historic watershed is that the underlying economics and te technological change have made it so. The, the U.S. is no longer the dominant world economy. And the G7, which is the U.S., Canada, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Japan, is actually smaller than the BRICS countries in economic size, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So we really are in fact, in a multipolar world, but in ideology, we're, we're in a conflict. Uh, but Jeffrey Sachs, I wanted to ask about that. Uh, you mentioned the BRICS. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the BRICS bank that is now in China, uh, and uh, President Lula has named Dilma Rousseff as the, as the head of the BRICS bank, it, it's important in terms of this multi, uh, multipolarity of, uh, in the world economies, the, the, and the potential for even the creation of alternative uh, major currencies to the dollar uh, as a result of the BRICS alliance. The impact of that uh, on uh, world affairs. This is a big deal. And in fact, the United States uh, is withdrawing. It doesn't know it necessarily. Our politicians don't understand this. But our politicians are withdrawing from the world financial and monetary scene and opening up the space for a completely different kind of international finance. I'll give you an example. The, the U.S. was the creator of the World Bank. But now the U.S. Congress won't put new money into the World Bank. Uh, and because of that, the World Bank's actually a quite small institution. It's got a big name, but it's a quite small institution in the financial scheme of things. The U.S. won't put more money in. The Congress says, no, why should we waste our money uh, internationally and so forth? And you get a lot of uh, hubbub about that. So China and the rest of the BRICs say, OK, we'll make our own development bank. And they established the new development bank, or sometimes called the BRICs Bank, based in Shanghai. And that's just one of the institutions that is really changing the scene. There's the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, based in Beijing, uh, in fact. Uh, there is, uh, as President Lula uh, said, and it's happening also in the context of the Ukraine war, a move away from the use of the dollar, which the United States has thought, well, that's that's our ace in the hole. You know, that is our ultimate hold on things because we can use sanctions. We can use our financial control to keep other countries in line. But other countries are saying, eh, not so much. We'll trade in renminbi. We'll trade in rubles. We'll trade in rupees. We'll, we'll trade in our own national currencies. And they're quickly setting up alternative institutions to do this. The United States doubles down. We will confiscate your reserves. We will, uh, if you don't follow. And the other countries are saying, you know, if you want to go through the UN and get 
really multilateral I'm, rules. I have a we're, we're with you. But but if you want uh, to just impose the rules, we won't follow along. And so we have this very funny expression called a rule-based international order. The United States government uses it every day. But what does it mean? Who writes the rules? And what most of the world wants, in fact, is rules written in a multipolar or multilateral setting, not rules written by the United States and a few friends and allies. I wanted to ask you, uh, you've been an advisor to, uh, to the United Nations for uh, quite often. The issue of how much longer the permanent members of the Security Council can keep the number to five, because clearly Brazil and other countries of the global south have been saying the U.N. needs to be reformed. Uh, and countries from Latin America, specifically Brazil and Africa, should have representation on the U.N. Security Council permanent members. Yes, uh, you know, the... P5, the permanent five, which is the United States, China, Russia, France, and the United Kingdom, was the World War II victor group in 1945. They wrote into the rules of the UN, incidentally, that they would be the permanent Security Council members and have a veto over any change in the UN charter. So it's it's really a group that uh, gave itself uh, power that uh, the other 188 countries uh, of the world look on and say, what is this? We need change. I, I would say the country that is most uh, uh, amazed and frustrated by this, uh, in fact, is India. India is now the most populous country in the world. Uh, the United States has 330 five million roughly uh, in the population, uh, Britain, France, uh, roughly 60 million, India, 1.4 billion, not on the Security Council, a nuclear power, a, a world superpower, the president of the G20 this year, really not happy about that. Uh, Brazil, uh, the large largest economy of South America, similarly uh, not on the Security Council. So this has been an issue for more than 20 years. The P5 in various ways have blocked uh, uh, particular countries, but added up the P5 have said, you know what, this is our club. We want to stay as the permanent five. But I think as we really face the reality of a, it's not just a post-U.S dominated world, but actually a post-Western dominated world, because it was the U.S. as the dominant power among the so-called West, which means the U.S., Britain, European Union, uh, and honorary Western membership, Japan, let's say. But we're post-Western as well as post-U.S. in dominance. And these international institutions will need to change or they won't function in the 21st century. And if they don't function, it's actually a disaster for us. If they didn't exist, we'd have to make them because we need them to function. So we also need to renovate them. I wanted to talk about uh, China um, negotiating these various agreements. Um, Let's turn to Brazil's President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva speaking before his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. What does Putin want? Putin can't keep Ukraine's territory. Maybe we don't even discuss Crimea, but he will have to rethink what he has invaded. Also, Zelensky can't have everything he wants to demand. NATO will not be able to set itself up at the border, so this is something we have to put on the table. I think this war has dragged on for too long. Brazil has already criticized what it had to criticize. Brazil defends each nation's territorial integrity, so we disagree with Russia's invasion of Ukraine.
Because it looks like um, Ukraine is on the verge of a major counteroffensive against Russia. And in order to do this, needs massive support from Western countries, meaning uh, military weapons. Uh, can you talk about um, what China's role is here, the peace plan it has put forward, but also these other deals that China is helping to negotiate, like the, success, uh, the successful rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and then what they're, uh, uh, what they're suggesting about Israel and Palestine? President Lula uttered, uh, in a few words, the core of this issue that our most of our media dare not explain to the American people, and that is the expansion of NATO. This is a war fundamentally about the U.S. attempt to expand a U.S. military alliance to Ukraine and to Georgia. Georgia is a country in the Caucasus, also on the Black Sea. The U.S. strategy, going back decades, has been to surround Russia in the Black Sea, with Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia, all NATO members surrounding Russia and its naval fleet in the Black Sea, with a naval fleet that has been the Black Sea naval fleet of Russia since 1783. Russia has said, this is our red line. And it has said that for decades. And it said this clearly in 2007, before George W. Bush Jr. had the, I'll call it the harebrained idea to announce in 2008 and force NATO to announce that Ukraine will be a member of NATO. And this is what President Lula was saying and what, Pres what uh, President Xi Jinping of China has been saying. We can't have a war that is essentially a proxy war between Russia and the United States over the expansion of the U.S. military alliance right up to a 1,200-kilometer and more border with Russia, which Russia views, and I would say understandably views, as a fundamental national security threat to Russia. Keep some space. Keep some distance. That's President Lula's meaning. That's what China means when it says in its peace plan, we want a peace plan that respects the security interests of all parties. What that is is code word for saying, make peace, end the war, but don't expand NATO right up to the border. The American people have not heard an explanation of this all along. It's shocking to me, because as a close observer of this for 30 years, this has been the casus belli, and yet our newspapers won't even report the background to this. But this is why China, South Africa, India, Brazil are saying, we want peace, but we don't want NATO expansion as the meaning of so-called peace. We want the big superpowers to give each other some space and some distance so that the world isn't on a knife edge. That's exactly what President Lula was saying, and it's exactly what the meaning of the Chinese peace initiative is, is to say, yes, absolutely make peace, protect Ukraine's sovereignty and its security, but no to NATO expansion. But the Biden administration won't even discuss this issue. That has been the major failing and the reason why we have not been able to get to the negotiating table, in my opinion, even when Zelensky said in March 2022, maybe not NATO, maybe something else, Russia and Ukraine were close to an agreement, and the United States intervened with Ukraine and said, mm, we don't think that's a good agreement, because the U.S. neocons, so-called, have been pushing for NATO enlargement as the core of this issue. But this goes back to the more general point for us, which is that what is at stake in Ukraine and over Taiwan and many other issues from the point of view of China or Russia or other countries, including Brazil, now Saudi Arabia, Iran, and others, is whether the U.S. does what it wants to do or whether the U.S. respects some limits based on what other 
countries say, well, this is what we think, so that we need true multipolarity, not U.S. dominance alone. Rules written... He said it was irrational. Frankly, his response was irrational. Uh, meanwhile, we've had actual Code, Code Pink members have met with representatives of China in Washington, D.C., to thank the Chinese government for uh, coming up with this peace plan and for playing a positive, a peacemaker's role. I mean, whatever people think about China and, and whatever criticisms they have, uh, I think we have to be very clear that China, as you mentioned, has well, maybe one or two overseas bases. It's not a, a threat militarily, and it is trying to play the role of peacemaker, not just in the Middle East, but also in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that China, the global South, can make a difference here. I mean, because it's not just China, it's Mexico, it's Brazil, it's other countries too that are saying, we need a ceasefire, we need it now, because they know the security of not just Ukraine and Russia and the United States is at stake, but the security of the entire globe. First, I think people should understand a basic fact about China. China has not engaged in one overseas war in the last 40 years while the United States has been engaged in non-stop wars. We keep pointing our finger at China. Look at how militaristic. We vastly outspend China on the military. We have surrounded China with military bases. We've been engaged in constant wars. We are trying right now to break the Chinese economy. And uh, then we point our finger like the G7 did uh, in this recent meeting in just a kind of a hate-filled, ignorant session. Look at how evil China is. Look at how evil China is. It's so low level for anyone who really follows this. I was uh, actually myself in China last month. I've been to China so many times over the last 40 years. We're in a propaganda field right now of anti-China propaganda that has no basis in reality. And we're trying to create an enemy there so we can crush China because they're daring to achieve economic development. So this is the starting point. Now, in terms of China's uh, peace plan, it has one crucial point. And it says that a peace agreement should respect the security interests of all parties. What does that mean? That's code for don't expand NATO because Russia understandably regards that as a direct security threat. To have NATO weapons on Russia's 1,900 kilometer border with Ukraine is not what Russia would like just like we would not be thrilled with Russian bases in Mexico or in Canada or any place else nearby. That's what Russia is trying to tell us. China gets it. China just uses very Confucian, if I could say, very nice orderly words, respect to the security interests of all parties. And that means to the United States, would you would you understand the what what Russia has been saying to the U.S. since Russia was independent, December 1991? Don't enlarge NATO, and especially since 2008. By God, not to Georgia! Are you kidding? That's what they've been telling us, and China gets it, and that's why Biden immediately rejected it. Because this is a game. The game is Newland's game to expand NATO to Ukraine. Okay? You know, I think a lot of people don't realize, Jeffrey Sachs, that this has been a long time coming, not just in terms of, you know, beginning in 2004 with the, with the greatest expansion of NATO, but also in 2020, we had uh, NATO recognize Ukraine as what I call a de facto member uh, with this interoperability agreement saying, you know, we're going to integrate our armed forces. Uh, now, what's the difference between being a de facto uh, member of NATO and an official member of NATO? Well, it could be what you're talking about, bases. It could be nuclear weapons. People say, well, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. 
first of all, they should all give them up, right? Uh, we should be pushing for the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which NATO emphatically opposes. So NATO- uh, And by the, the way, if I may just- Yeah, weapons. if I may just say that I'm under the- the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which we are a major signatory, we are bound to nuclear disarmament, but we're not even trying right now. So we're not even uh, honoring the treaties that we're in, much less joining the treaties that we ought to be joining. So this is a, a terrible thing. And by the way, that's a huge budget cost. That is hundreds of billions of dollars that we're spending on, quote, modernizing the nuclear weapons rather than negotiating nuclear disarmament. So that's another part to come yeah. back to the budget story of the past. Mm -hmm. But th this story of NATO goes back actually to the early 1990s. I spoke with a hist wonderful historian uh, recently who told me that in documents that he is reviewing, he hasn't published yet, Ukraine was already on a list for NATO enlargement in 1992. Now that's, you know, years before Putin's anywhere around uh, on this. This is a plan that goes back to the neocons with Cheney and Wolfowitz uh, in and Rumsfeld in the Bush administration. So this goes back, a, and now I'll, interestingly, if you look up it's, it's a fascinating article. Zbig Brzezinski in 1997 in Foreign Affairs magazine, mind you, this is before Putin's president by years. In 1997, Zbig Brzezinski spells out the timeline for expanding NATO to Ukraine. And he says almost exactly the sequence as it actually happened, because what he was writing in 1997 was not just his ideas, he was writing what was already in the works inside the government. So this is a story that goes back 25 years at least, and it's been hidden from the American people. And they thought they'd get it on a bluff. The real idea of the United States was, What's, what's Putin going to do? We're going to expand NATO and what's he going to do? And he's going to complain and we're going to say it's none of your business and we're going to expand. And that was really their idea. Then Yanukovych got in the way. Yanukovych, president of Ukraine, who said, no, I don't want Ukraine to be in, in uh, NATO. That's very dangerous. We'll be neutral. Well, <laughs> the U.S. helped get rid of him. So this is a long, long story. None of it told honestly to the American people. And then if you say it now that this had something to do with the war, try to get it published in the New York Times. You can't. Jeffrey, people say, I've heard this over and over again, and they quote different people, unnamed people, I won't give them the credit here. Uh, they say, look, the reason why Putin has not invaded Poland, let's say, is because Poland is a member of NATO. So Ukraine needs this protection. <laughs> if if Ukraine were a member, an official, not just a de facto or interoperability uh, member of NATO, then Putin never would have invaded. That's possible. But you know what? Uh, the way we did it, we virtually guaranteed a war. Period. In other words, uh, to say, okay, Ukraine, uh, yeah, you're going to join NATO, and the Russians are saying against our border? No. And then letting, as this uh, occurred, they said, you keep pushing this, uh, we're gonna have war. And the war started in 2014 because the safety for Ukraine was when Ukraine was saying, we don't even want it, stop, don't, don't get us into the middle of this war between the two of you. So the fact of the matter is this, NATO enlargement was completely unnecessary and provocative all the way back to the 1990s. And then we saw in but, 2019, but, but just Ukraine to say, embedded in its constitution this well, vow to yeah, join NATO. Ju just to say, even the first round, which was Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, the Russians hated it, but it didn't cause a war. That's far from their borders. Then the next round came, and the Russians were really 
really annoyed because that one was on their border with the Baltics. So it was Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, and Romania. And then they said, oh, come on, what do you stop? Then in 2007, Putin said, okay, you've done it. You keep expanding NATO. You promised you wouldn't, but you keep doing it. Stop. Do not come up to our border with Ukraine and Georgia. And by the way, people should take a map out and understand a little bit about this. The real goal of these neocons, the Newland neocons, is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. This is why, where does Georgia come in here? I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, Georgia's the country in the Caucasus. Where does that come from? If you look at a map, the idea of these neocons is that you have Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And Putin's saying, don't do this, stop. And he says this in 2007, then in 2008, Bush pushes this and Newland is key member of the administration then. And they push this over the opposition of the Europeans and get the Bucharest NATO declaration to declare that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, will. And by the way, Biden has been part of this all along. And the military industrial complex has pushed this. The, lo the literal lobbies for NATO enlargement have been Raytheon people. I mean, you can't make this up. This is how the U.S. government works. Lastly, Raytheon. Jeffrey Sachs, yes. I want to ask you about Ukraine and the future of Ukraine. Should we continue on this uh, calamitous path of endless war, uh, funding the propping up the Ukrainian government to, to the tune of six billion dollars a month, spending over 115 billion dollars to continue the war, half of that going to military contractors for weapons and, and military training. Uh, meanwhile, uh, what's going to happen to the Ukrainian economy because We've already read about Zelensky privatizing a lot of these industries that were nationalized under the Soviet Union. And we know that BlackRock, representatives of BlackRock have been over in Ukraine. And we know that Zelensky has a website. And on the website, there's a menu for privatizing Ukraine and, and inviting investors to, yes, invest in the military in Ukraine. Where do you see this going? Should we continue on this course? Look, Ukraine is being destroyed. This is. The first tragedy is for Ukraine itself. <clears throat> Being a place where the U.S. wages a proxy war is the worst place you can be. As, as Kissinger famously said, you know, to be an enemy of the United States uh, is dangerous, but to be a friend can be fatal. We are killing Ukraine. Literally, we're killing Ukrainians, but we're killing Ukraine. Think of how we loved Afghanistan, how we love South Vietnam. What do we do, Iraq? If, you're, if you are the place where the US is waging a proxy war, first of all, you will be physically destroyed. You will have mass out migration of young people, of talented people, of people just trying to survive for God's sake. You'll have your infrastructure destroyed. All of this, the, the Ukrainian economy is busted and the, the Ukrainian population has shrunk tremendously because people have left the country. And so this is no way helping Ukraine. This is just, I tried to tell the Ukrainians, I'm, I'm for you, I'm not against you. This is, they kept thinking, oh, that's Putin propaganda. I said, no, listen, I go back to the Vietnam War in the United States, to Iraq, Afghanistan. I've seen what happens when the US grabs you in a proxy war. And this is what's happening right now to Ukraine. It's being tragically destroyed. And every time things don't work, our side ratchets up and they, keep ratcheting up and sad to say, you know, Obama knew in 2014, he, he got the main point when he said and 
actively left behind this progress that are really struggling for a variety of reasons. People live in more remote areas or in very unfavorable geographies or are part of minority groups that have been maltreated within societies or half the population, women and girls that traditionally were not part of the market economy, were part of the household economy, and have definitely seen uh, progress, but facing a lot of social obstacles still today, which is why one of the sustainable development goals is directed specifically at the issues of gender, SDG 5. So one of the three huge challenges is that we have a rich world and a lot of very poor and suffering people within that world. And that's just, uh, I think for most of our, us, humanly unacceptable. And indeed, when the UN was established in 1948, all of the member states agreed that there should be basic standards of life for every person on the planet because they're people on the planet, because they're human beings. And the world is productive enough to ensure the dignity of everybody. And that's why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. And I regard us still trying to honor that declaration, which seems to me to be the basic point. So problem number one is the very uneven development, the fact that there is still today uh, a significant part of the world that lives in really abject deprivation. And that's uh, a first challenge. And I think it's ethically probably the number one challenge because extreme deprivation in a world of plenty is absolutely uh, destructive of all of our humanity if we don't solve that problem. So that's why SDG 1 is end extreme poverty. Straightforward. And SDG 2, the second highest priority, is end hunger, for heaven's sake. Of course, there are big challenges of how to do it. But I will say, in a world of wealth and knowledge, this is definitely within reach. It's crazy, to my mind, that if the average income is $12,000 per capita, there are people living at a few hundred dollars per capita, and the world just goes on as they suffer and die young and face terrible hardships. The second big challenge, the huge challenge, the puzzle that is even harder than the first one conceptually, is that we discovered about 50 years ago that the nature of our economic development, all that wealth that I just talked about, is environmentally destructive because the much vaunted economic processes don't take care of their physical byproducts. And some of them were not understood till 50 or 100 years ago, like greenhouse gases and their effects on climate. That, was, that required a scientific breakthrough of a quite deep order to understand that. It came by the end of the 19th century, and then it took at least uh, 75 years to create measurement systems to verify the science. And we've more or less known from around 1980 that humanity is really changing the climate in ways that could be dangerous. And we're still struggling with that fact, because what brought us that wealth in the first place, starting in the 1800s, was fossil fuels. And then we discovered about halfway through, oh, those are dangerous. That's not good. So this is the second big problem, is that we have an 
economic system and a set of laws, rules, regulations, a global commons, the open seas, and many other factors of our economic system that mean that uh, the scale of production is now self-destructive. And as I say, we've understood this intellectually at least for 70, uh, at least for about 50 years. Uh, it was 50 years ago that the first conference on this fact took hold. It was 51 years ago that the first good book about this limits to growth was written and made clear that there was a real problem. And we've not finished solving that problem. But let me stipulate the following, just like I did for the first one. There's nothing fundamental about these environmental challenges that is beyond our solution, even with our current knowledge base. In other words, we already in 2023 have the range of technical solutions to 90% of the greenhouse gases, not 100%. We definitely don't face a choice between food and nature. We face a choice between, uh, un between destructive and non-destructive forms of food production. That's a very different choice. I haven't found in 40 years of my work on this a fundamental barrier to economic well-being and environmental sustainability. So I'm not in the degrowth school of thought, which says that what we really need is to reverse economic development. Not all economic development is good for human well-being. That's a different matter. But I'm not of the school of thought that says we've created a kind of society that is completely inconsistent with our environmental necessities or our environmental well-being or health. What we have is a very flawed economic system legal system, regulatory system, incentive structure, so that we adopt or continue with technologies that are very ill-advised and do lots of stupid things because it's possible to make money off of those stupid things rather than do the things that we should be doing. And I've not seen in all of my experience any calculations that show me that this, that doing the right things is beyond our reach, beyond our budget, beyond our uh, economic means. For example, all of the estimates about the energy transformation to a zero carbon energy system suggest that it's one or two percent of world output that is needed to make that change. That's really strange. It's not that it's 50% of world output that's needed. It's not that this is cataclysmically expensive and we're just doomed as if an asteroid were coming to hit the planet and we have nothing to do. No, we have clear, very, very clear things to do. Sometimes we have too many possible things to do so we don't know which one to take, so we're paralyzed. Should we do wind or solar or nuclear or this? I don't know. We won't do anything right now. We're making money with what we're doing. So we're paralyzed. Or we know what to do, but there are strong vested interests saying don't do it because I'm making too much money in the short term doing the destructive things, or it just is complicated and hasn't been thought out properly because this is something absolutely new. It was rather straightforward to build a coal plant, but it's not so straightforward perhaps to 
build offshore wind or solar fields or something else because of storage or other issues. So there are just complexities. But that's the second big category of challenge that we face, which is this economic environmental collision course, which again needs analysis and then needs to ask, how deep is the problem? And for me, and how solvable is the problem? So the climate crisis is very deep, but it's also rather solvable. And there are some puzzles, definitely. What should big ocean tankers run on? Should it be hydrogen fuel cells? Should it be ammonia? Should it be hydrogen combustion? I'm not an engineer. I've heard the arguments from the engineers. I want them to fight it out. I want them to try different approaches. But clearly, we should be trying these technology lines. The th third big challenge, which is a challenge of time immemorial, is that we seem to have a very hard time to stop killing each other. So war becomes all ever more dangerous because the weapons become ever more destructive. And now we're technologically so smart that we figured out how to destroy the whole humanity. Damn it. If we weren't so smart, we wouldn't have this trouble. But a few geniuses figured out you could make nuclear fission work to make a bomb. By the way, there were probably 50 people in the world that understood that. And they figured it out, and then they gave it to a world of idiots. So we have a lot of dumb people who are in charge of nuclear weapons. And they were made by a few geniuses. That's our problem. So this is our third issue, which is how to stay peaceful and cooperative. To my mind, these are the three big issues that we face, which is how to be fair and decent to people who are suffering, how to make sure that we're not self-destructive because our economic system is actually a complicated set of incentives that doesn't get things right. And there's no magic in how we have organized our economic life to handle issues like greenhouse gases, which weren't in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and are not part of the uh, things that uh, a free market can solve and so forth. And the third is this interminable problem that if you read human history, we've been fighting with each other most of the time. But there are also glimmers of hope that there are long periods of peace. And we also have institutions for peace, just like we have institutions for war. One of the things that makes me quite optimistic about China's rise is that China has been much more peaceful in its history than just about any other region of the world. And the amount of interstate war of China over the last 2,000 years is actually quite low. It's basically been wars of uh, pastoralists coming from the north uh, and uh, sedentary farmers trying to fight them off. Uh, and that's been most of China's wars for 2,000 years. If you look at Europe's wars, it was just kill each other across the divide for a 1,000 years, nonstop. Um, so China at least has a peaceful tradition. And I think it fits, actually, with this idea of harmonious uh, society, with the idea of uh, global civilizations and so forth. I'm quite an optimist, I have to say, about that, because I think it uh, actually there's a, a deep rootedness. So that's all we have to do. End poverty, protect the environment, stop killing with each other. All right? So 
Thank you. No. Okay. So, no. so what do we do? To my mind, the basic thing is we should think hard about each of those things and then come up with plans. That's the most basic idea. That sounds so dumb. Why am I saying that after 40 years? Don't I have anything more intelligent to say? And the thing is that the way that our social systems work is not to think and then solve these things. And that's very interesting. Our economic system is designed around a different principle, which is let people do what they want, get rich, go find your job, go uh, buy what you want, but not solve problems. So in economic land, it's not oriented towards solving problems. It's oriented towards doing your thing. Businesses are supposed to go make profits, and we're supposed to be good consumers, and we're supposed to be smart in the job that we pursue. But at least in market economics, which is, became the dominant uh, ideology of the Anglo-Saxon world and then the world, it isn't to solve problems. It's go do your thing. So don't expect the answers to these problems to come from the economic sphere or from the business community. It's not their job. Their job is to run a business. It's to make money. So that's problem number one, that we don't think in the economic sphere about end goals. We're supposed to just do our thing. And then politicians. In most politics, it's not about solving problems. It's about maintaining power. And that's even the goal. And you have experts on maintaining power. All the politicians have little Machiavellis around them, handing them, this is what you need to do to stay in power. And that's your goal. And so politics, at least in my country, has very little to do with any goals. I don't know what any American goals are. We have no goals. We have some heroes, our founding fathers. We love the Constitution. We like the July 4th Independence Day. But we have no goals. And even when I hear Dr. Zhao talk about China's goals, you could not have that in the United States, stating those goals. Because that's, that's, that's socialism. Uh, you're not allowed to have goals. So politics is not oriented towards solving problems, really. It's management, management of power, competition for power holding on to power, benefiting from power. And so we don't see from our governments most of the time these big goals and how to solve them. I really think China's been different in this period, the last 40 years, from most other governments. And I think the success is a result of that, actually, that it's really, and why? Well, I think this is a very interesting question, but um, a few countries at a few times have very clear goals, maybe because of survival, maybe because of their past history, maybe because they have a successful uh, neighbor, uh, so they want to imitate the success, maybe like in Singapore, because uh, a genius came. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, and he had a very, very clear idea. And really, Singapore, it is a case of a very clear, brilliant thinker who just guided things for quite a while, like uh, Plato's philosopher King. But most of the time, this is not how politics is. 
So we don't see a lot of this problem solving coming from governments. And the third thing is, in my country, which became the most powerful country in the world for uh, the last 75 years militarily, they really think that fighting wars is a big part of what governance is about. They're crazy and dangerous and could get us all killed. So that third category of just peaceful cooperation does not come easily. Every day we read something hateful about China in the American newspapers now. Every single day. I just read uh, today, China has multiple fundamental inventions from the use of the compass for navigation, paper currency, public administration, uh, ocean navigation, uh, movable type printing, and countless other inventions that um, changed the world fundamentally. So not only was China populous, but China was really uh, dominant. And throughout much of Asia, and especially East Asia, uh, it was China that set the civilizational patterns for uh, what is today's uh, countries of uh, Southeast Asia uh, and Japan and Korea. Uh, and this civilization, uh, which was a Neo-Confucian civilization, was a, a remarkable achievement. At this time, we had the high medieval period in Western Europe, and um, some breakthroughs were starting, a lot of wars, by the way. And, uh, but Europe would have looked to any observer at the time as a taker of technology, uh, a receiver of technology, not as a maker or giver of technology. And the technology came from the East in many directions, from the Arab world, from the Indian subcontinent from China. There are some notable dates. The worst economic policy mistake in human history was made by China in 1434, when the uh, Ming Dynasty decided to end ocean navigation and to scrap the fleet of Admiral Zheng He because China would have discovered the New World, it would have discovered the Americas, it would have created a world economy, but uh, China was concerned, the, the court was concerned about the incursions from the north, uh, not from the gains of ocean navigation, and the great uh, fleet of uh, Admiral Zheng was ended, and those were the end of the ocean navigations. The, the oceans were given over to the Europeans, actually. This was really one of the most decisive own goals of human history, I have to say. Uh, now, the next date that's important is 1492, because uh, as China vacated the oceans, uh, Portugal and Spain filled uh, the oceans using Chinese technology, by the way, uh, the ocean navigation. Uh, and the gunpowder, which all had come from China, to begin uh, an age of uh, navigation. Still, without the fortuitous fact that heading west from Europe landed a continent that was not known to the Europeans, history would not have changed all that fundamentally. But the Americas became a uh, resource base for Europe's development for the next four centuries, which fundamentally changed the world. And Adam Smith, writing in 1776, said that the two most significant events in the history of mankind were the discovery of the Americas by Columbus in 1492 and the discovery of the path around the Cape of Good Hope by Vasco da Gama in 1498. So that was a turning point. Still, Asia was dominant, but this little peninsula on the far west of Eurasia began to explore and ironically conquered the Americas, and that was 
by virtue of pathogens rather than uh, any dominance because the Europeans brought smallpox, yellow fever, malaria, and many other diseases and wiped out the Native American populations by around 95% and were able to conquer, therefore, a two continents of massive resource base. So history began to change. The next date that I would suggest as fundamental is 1776. That's a very interesting year. Four things happened that year. Uh, you know some of them. The most important uh, was James Watt patented the steam engine in that year. Uh, a second uh, decisive uh, event was that Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. The third uh, decisive event was that Gibbon published The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And then there was something, a declaration of independence of some country also. All happened in that year. But the invention of the steam engine was a turning point as significant as 1434 and 1492 because Though the steam engine had been invented by China, it had not been utilized by any scale in China. China had invented the steam engine about 700 years earlier. Watt improved the steam engine with a condenser, and Britain became the first industrial country. And this was very significant because in 1839, my next date, Britain invaded China uh, in the First Opium War. Uh, the war fought to make the world safe for opium uh, addiction. Uh, really a, a <coughs> sordid act, but just an illustration of what had changed fundamentally in power. From China's dominance, now China was uh, in uh, defeat by the British, by a British expeditionary force from not quite halfway around the world, but was able to uh, defeat uh, the Chinese uh, Ming, uh, or Qing, uh, sorry, uh, Qing uh, uh, Empire. Of course, it, I won't go into long history, but the defeats in the two opium wars was followed by the Taiping Rebellion and by probably the worst, well, the worst civil war perhaps in human history in terms of the human toll in the Taiping Rebellion. And China went from being an absolute great power to being a subjected country uh, and one that faced extreme poverty and hardship later in invasion by many imperial powers along the coast, and then the invasion by Japan starting in 1894-95, uh, uh, and then in the 20th century. For me, the uh, next turning point is 1947 and 1949, the independence of India and the independence of China. I think there's one key point in history, which is a colonized or imperialized country cannot achieve economic development or success because it is not in the interest of the imperial power to uh, have success in its colonies. The interest of an imperial power is extraction. And so until independence came after this terrible hundred years, China and India were left behind, far behind economic development. So the next turning point in history was the middle of the 20th century when Asia began to recover. And if you look statistically, Asia had been around 60% of world output for 1,800 years roughly, from as much as one can measure this, from 1 AD to roughly 1800 AD. And then by 1950, it had declined to 15% or perhaps 20% of world output, though the population was still 60%. So the per capita income had collapsed. 
what we are experiencing now is the recovery of normality not something uh, outside of human experience but actually the recovery of normality because what was abnormal was that a small part of the world the north atlantic region would so dominate the whole world and that was by virtue of the technological advances starting with steam engine and then the militarization of those technologies which led to a century of imperial domination by western countries this would have lasted longer but the west fought two disastrous bloody civil wars world war one and world war two and by the end of that period uh, it was of course morally politically economically financially militarily incapable of empire and with some lagging battles the countries found their way to independence <laughs> so asia began to recover dramatically fast and by around 2010 china was larger than the u.s economy in absolute size measured in purchasing power firms but not surprising because china is more than four times the u.s population or was then now it's about four times the u.s population and so naturally it would become a bigger country two implications and i'll stop here one is that now that the whole world has in, is industrializing and we're going to have development everywhere uh, india was behind china by about 15 or 20 years but now india is growing faster than china is likely to continue to do so africa is going to grow faster than both india and china in the next 40 years because it's going to be catching up from farther back and by the way africa right now has the same size population as china and india all are 1.4 billion but africa will be the biggest by mid-century by far so if there's an african union the african union will be the most populous part of the world by 2050 by far and it will be a dynamic part of the world economy also so we're going to have lots of mindset changes uh, in the years ahead but there are two significant conclusions from this one is mainly the united states has been shocked at china's rise and i have to say to my chinese friends you didn't ask permission you know the u.s is supposed to be in charge and now without u.s permission you became so big and powerful and that is a bit unforgivable in the american mentality the americans cannot figure it out because they know no history at all i'm sorry to say we're doing our best as teachers but we're not doing very well so the idea that what's happened in china is a return to normal is ununderstandable and this is why there's so much tension right now so it's very serious and the tension came when china declared in the made in china 2025 program we will become key leaders of leading technologies that was the biggest affront to the americans i say bravo go for it this is good for the world uh, technological advance anywhere lifts everyone by the way as long as it's not militarized and leads to destruction but as long as it's used for human well-being and by the way chinese technologies are already core to saving the world uh, whether it's medicines like artemisinin or whether it's the lowest cost solar production solar modules this is chinese technology and we need it it's going to be critical for world well-being but one thing is the tension coming with china's recovery we need dialogue on this to understand it so that's one part second is that as the whole world economy has grown roughly a hundred times since James Watt's steam engine, I would say realistically maybe 250 times since James Watt's steam engine, we're wrecking the natural environment. 
we really are it's extremely serious it's very late in the day and so we need a common understanding of how we're going to get our own now globally shared technologies under control so that is why i'm so happy to be here i think uh, i do think we're going to figure this out uh, but the strangest part of globalization is how little global dialogue there is it's the paradox it's so easy to have connection you can get on a zoom with anybody but it's a big event if an american official official talks to a chinese official it should be happening dozens of times a day not top news and i keep offering to president biden now give you a zoom link you can call president putin and make peace or a phone number i'll lend you my cell phone make a call but here we are completely interconnected but we don't talk with each other and the specialty of the church is talking with each other so here we are thank you very much quality of political leadership is extremely low uh, our president is 81 years old and should be in retirement. This is absolutely obvious. Uh, our Congress is quite corrupt in the United States because we have a, a system of campaign financing that depends on billions and billions of dollars going from big companies to the uh, congressmen and senators. Uh, and the U.S. isn't alone in this. Uh, there's a, a great deal of instability, and our political leaders don't know how to get along with each other. Uh, so you add this all up, it's definitely bad, whether it's absolutely the worst. It's a little hard to judge, but it's bad enough that we ought to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually mentioned many questions that I was going to ask, uh, but um, if I understand correctly, um, how did we get there actually? So definitely there is some kind of crisis of leadership, because I believe that the problem is not only a, a senior American president, uh, uh, well, and uh, well, these, these problems can be also in, in other countries. Uh, then of course, there's a concentration of unprecedented crises. Uh, and of course, there is a part, I would say, that's considering the decisions that the superpowers make. W would you agree with this, with this combination? I think if I could uh, put one word on uh, the reason we're in this crisis, it is arrogance. Arrogance of the rich and the powerful. And um, the United States uh, was the richest and the most powerful. Uh, of all during this period. So the arrogance of the United States uh, has been extremely notable. You know, when the Cold War ended in uh, 1989 uh, in uh, uh, Central Europe and in 1991 in uh, the former Soviet Union, we might have said, now we have a glorious opportunity for peace, for cooperation, and for prosperity. Uh, this didn't happen. It could have happened. I was there. I saw what could have been done. Uh, instead, the United States said, we won. We're the best. We're the most powerful. We don't have to deal with anybody except on our own terms. And the United States absolutely uh, went from arrogant to hyper arrogant uh, and said, we can do what we want where we want. And strangely enough, though, the United States basically faced no security threats after that time. It went to war more often than, than ever. Uh, of course, it completely uh, misjudged two things. One, it continued to think of Russia as a natural enemy and so it, it actually created a new enemy because I was advisor to Gorbachev. I was advisor to Yeltsin. They wanted absolute peace and normal relations. There's no doubt in my mind. 
This wasn't a trick. It wasn't a plot. It was in an attempt to create normal relations. The United States instead said, oh, no, no, we won. We won. Now we'll move NATO. Uh, okay. Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Poland. Oh, we'll keep moving. We'll go to the Baltics. Uh, we'll go to Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, we'll go to the Balkans. Oh, no, no, no. We'll go to Ukraine. We'll go to Georgia. We'll surround Russia. We'll decolonize Russia. That's a term used in American political circles. Uh, even saying, oh, Russia should be dismembered now. Well, what on earth are these people thinking? Russia has 6,000 nuclear warheads, a powerful army, a uh, uh, self-respect, uh, and uh, a desire for its own security. Uh, and so the United States provoked what absolutely it should not have provoked. So this was a, a part of the issue. A second part of the issue is that, in general, the uh, rich became arrogant in a different way, saying, oh, we're so good. We used to be millionaires. Now we're billionaires. We don't have to share anything. So they became libertarian in philosophy. Libertarian uh, in American philosophy means we don't have to pay taxes because what we have is ours and nobody's going to take it away. And so we developed a super rich class uh, that became very self-righteous. That's my money. It's nobody else's money. How dare the government think to take it? And at the same time, a growing uh, amount of people struggling in poverty or losing jobs to technology, being replaced by robots being replaced by automation. So the gap in our society between the rich and the poor widened considerably. And this was the second factor. And you would think that in a political democracy, the poor people would vote out uh, the uh, ones that uh, are uh, leaning on them or would uh, vote for tax increases on the small group of very powerful, but that theory is wrong because the small group of very powerful buy the politicians. <laughs> they, they really do. Uh, and so they pay the campaign contributions. And the first rule of the U.S. Congress is vote tax cuts for companies and, and uh, rich individuals. So that is the second thing that happened. The third thing that happened is that the environmental crises especially the climate change crisis, came and would require changes in our behavior and would also cause limitations to the big energy industry, the oil, the gas, the coal industry. And um, the industry resisted those changes, said no. And the politicians said, oh, it's not even real, uh, like uh, Václav Klaus and, and others. Uh, you know, they just denied the climate change. And uh, this denial has gone on for decades, uh, actually. We just uh, saw a new uh, president of uh, Argentina elected just now who said that climate change is a socialist plot. You can't even make this up. I don't know whether this is uh, just playing games to get elected, whether it's complete sheer ignorance, whether it's corruption. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's shocking. People in any kind of responsibility should know better. They should at least understand what this issue is about. And this has been a very big challenge. It's, again, part of the arrogance. Uh, I happen to lead a scientific institute at Columbia University with hundreds of climate scientists, so I had an earful all the time about the climate science. Many people don't have that chance to hear directly, so they hear from politicians or actors or actors who want to be politicians uh, who say uh, whatever they feel like, and the result is that we go 
decade after decade without solving these problems, despite all the meetings, the treaties, the conferences, uh, and so forth. So when you add all of this up, uh, as I said, I think the underlying problem is arrogance of the rich and the powerful who somehow think the rules don't apply to them. Uh, and we end up in a world that is in conflict. We end up in a world that is divided between rich and poor. We end up in a world that is uh, facing massive environmental crises. And it's all so weird because the world's richer than ever before, better technologies than ever before. And we could, if we chose right, move to peace immediately. I just mm -hmm. testified in the UN Security Council about four wars, the war in Ukraine, uh, the uh, war in Israel and Palestine, the war in Syria, and the war in the Sahel of Africa, which is Burkina, Mali, Chad, mm -hmm. Niger. And I pointed out all four of these huge wars could be stopped tomorrow with politics, with basic sound politics. But our leaders are just incapable of basic sound politics, unfortunately. When you mentioned arrogance and the beginning of the 90s, well, I, I am from the Czech Republic, as you know myself. So, yes, we, I, I, we have a vast experience uh, <laughs> with no liberal policies and their application. However, I, I wanted to ask about liberal democracy. Of course, we, we have to mention Francis Fukuyama and his end of history. And now we see how, how completely wrong that was. But uh, do you see also the, the liberal democracy as something that maybe hides more the true state of affairs uh, than actually helps to resolve uh, the conflicts? Uh, because, uh, you know, when scholars like Martin Wolf suggest that maybe instead of voting, we should have some, you know, choice by chance randomly, mm -hmm. that would be better than elect the representatives that we have, that there's certainly something wrong. So maybe if you could elaborate on, on the liberal democracy and maybe it really will be an end, but the question is what kind of end it will be. It would be great if we could make democracy work uh, because uh, democracy is very attractive in principle. Uh, it's a, a way for free people to express themselves. It's a way for people to participate. It's a way for people to learn about social and political realities. So it, in principle, is a very attractive system. Uh, and in general, it's a way for people to have protection from their own governments because non-democratic governments can be very, very destructive of their own people because there's no control necessarily over government. So in principle, I'm a Democrat, uh, but in practice, you can see all of the difficulties of making this work. A democracy needs to have an informed public. A democracy needs to have a respectful uh, dialogue or deliberation in the public, not shouting, not even worse uh, violence, uh, not uh, 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 hidden influence. Uh, a democracy needs to prevent being taken over by powerful interests that use the democracy as a as a facade, uh, as a pretense rather than real democracy. So some democracies work pretty well. Uh, some in Europe work reasonably well. I would say the quality of the American democracy has declined tremendously during my lifetime. Um, Maybe that's an illusion, but I feel that. And I can see even in the data that people had more confidence in government 60 years ago than they have today. And I look at that and I've of course spent my whole life trying to understand that declining 
confidence in our government. And I find two factors uh, that are at the core of this. One is that after World War II, the United States created a security state uh, with the CIA and other institutions that were supposedly ensuring national security. But in fact, they really diminished democracy because the first principle of the CIA is that it's secret and its actions are secret. And um, it does lots of things around the world that are not good, but they're secret. So this really undermined American democracy. And um, we don't have a de we don't have much public effect on foreign policy, for example, in the United States, because when it comes to foreign policy, really the president and a few uh, other people make decisions on behalf of everybody without public debate or without uh, control by any really democratic institutions other than a vote once every few years. But that's not enough because we go to war all the time against the interests of the American people. Um, so that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem that I mentioned earlier is the big money in politics. Some countries restrict private campaign financing. In fact, most in Europe don't have a lot of corruption of the political system. But the United States, I regard as kind of legal corruption, legal in the sense that our Supreme Court said that companies can spend whatever they want on politics, no restriction and or few restrictions. Um, and the result is our election cycle, say the 2024 election, will spend maybe $15 billion of campaign financing. Now, you don't get honest government with so much money changing hands. Uh, you get government that is purchased by the highest bidder. And this is uh, why the confidence in democracy has declined so much. You mentioned, of course, the power of big money. I, I wouldn't be so optimistic about the situation in Europe. I just believe because the economies are weaker, then uh, there's not so much money as in the US, but the tendency is practically, uh, practically the same. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Joe Biden and, of course, then President Trump. Uh, probably they'll meet in, in elections next year. Probably. Um, do, do you see the crisis in, in leadership? Because when we uh, look in the past, we see many strong leaders who were both from Europe, from the United States, who were able to offer some vision and lead a society. Some of them even towards a peaceful society. We mentioned Willy Brandt, Olaf Palme. We can also mention, well, we can also mention Ronald Reagan uh, as a special type of American heritage as well. Uh, I would say there is a certain decline in these leadership uh, qualities. Do, do you view it as well? Because in, in Europe, it's, I think, uh, very visible. <laughs> yes, I think the quality of the political leadership in the US and Europe is very weak right now in general. Uh, speaking of the United States, uh, we have uh, two leading candidates, one of whom is 81 and can't find his way off the stage anymore. He happens to be our president. Uh, and uh, the other one is a convicted, uh, uh, is, is multiply convicted, uh, 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 psychologically unstable person uh, who now faces uh, dozens of criminal uh, counts right now in trials coming up. So Maybe we'll have a, a, a an octogenarian uh, who is uh, who should never be running and, and a convicted felon uh, running uh, uh, for the presidency. This is a terrible, terrible thing, obviously. Uh, how can we get there? There are some other candidates. Uh, I'm hoping that Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Uh, proves himself as a highly capable candidate. And I like him. We were schoolmates. Uh, we're friends. Uh, and uh, he comes from a great political tradition. In fact, uh, his uncle, uh, John F. Kennedy, was, in my view, the last great American president. 
uh, because uh, after that, well, we had some very nice and smart people, a few, not very many. Jimmy Carter was one. Uh, but um, we've had a lot of failed presidents uh, and oh. failed presidencies. So the quality of leadership is uh, is quite low. And in Europe, it's also really surprising to me how when the United States makes such bad judgments, European leaders tend to follow along uh, the U.S. lead. And of course, I'm very unhappy about the Ukraine war. I mean, everyone's unhappy about it, but I have a view that's somewhat different from the mainstream view, which is, in my interpretation, the war in Ukraine was caused by the U.S. wanting to expand NATO. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, many in Europe say, no, 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 it's all Putin. Uh, he, he did this. But I, I know enough history and I was present uh, at enough okay. events to know how much the U.S. provoked this war through absolutely stupid policies. Because if you're smart, you don't push a military alliance right up against Russia's border. Uh, that's just not a wise thing to do. Russia's extremely sensitive to uh, the military of the West encroaching on it because of how many times Russia's been invaded by the West. And especially when the United States politicians have so much hostility to Russia, which they do. They openly express the idea that Russia should be dismantled and many other things. Of course, Russia is going to see NATO expansion as a direct threat to national security, and it's not going to let it happen. So this uh, is just an example of terrible policy, predictable disaster. But the U.S. went along with it. Now, my point was, the Europeans knew better. Mm -hmm. I know because many Europeans told me many times, oh, NATO expansion to Ukraine is very dangerous, but then mm -hmm. they don't say it in public. Uh, and uh, they don't say it in public because the United States uh, would get mad at them. And, uh, you know, they're afraid of the U.S. They shouldn't be afraid of the U.S. Europe should have its own independent foreign policy. And it should understand its own interests. Uh, and the interests are not just following along the United States. So this is a, a, just an, a very important example of the weakness of the political leadership right now in, in Europe as well as in the United States. Yeah, we, we see that here very well. So they're actually not able even to formulate the national interests. And I don't know if, if it's fear or simply they are not capable to understand what's going on. Maybe it's a combination of both. However, the, con uh, the consequences are really disastrous for the EU, both economically and politically, of course. What, you mentioned what, what, one, one European political leader said to me uh, a couple of years ago, oh, they don't take us seriously in Washington. And um, he said it even more colorfully, which I won't repeat exactly, but uh, this was a leader of a major country. And my thought was, yeah, but you should not allow yourself to be treated that way. That's your fault. Uh, that's not America's fault. Yes, America's arrogant, but stand up for Europe. Uh, and uh, this should be the approach, but it's not the approach. New money. So as the old debt was coming due, a government would normally borrow new money to pay off the old money and keep the debt level pretty much the same. But Argentina has no friends. Nobody trusts it. So as the Argentine debt was coming due, everyone wanted to be repaid. Thank you. No more loans. So I was trying to help since uh, part of my work over the last 40 years has been in economic emergencies. And I helped them negotiate arrangements with their bank creditors, and I helped them negotiate arrangements with the International Monetary Fund. And I said, oh, God, this is tough. Nobody believes in Argentina, least of all the Argentines. 
So after these uh, agreements were reached, I flew to Buenos Aires and I met in a large room with Argentina's Pubas, the, uh, the powers and shakers. And I said, you know, your situation is not as bad as you think. Your debt is actually not so high. Uh, your uh, need for the central bank to print money is actually not so high. It's just that nobody trusts you. So if we could regain trust, believe me, you know, your balance sheet is actually better than the U.S. government. It's just that in the U.S., everybody uses the dollar so you could run big budget deficits. But Argentina's budget deficit was smaller than the U.S. and Argentina's uh, uh, inflation soared because everyone was always ready to run out of the peso. OK, so I said, just rebuild trust. I felt pretty good, compelling speech, showed the data, showed that the U.S. is worse at a fundamental level than uh, Argentina, flew home. And within days, the finance minister basically resigned because his own political party more or less disowned him after he had gotten these agreements. Oh, my God. OK, he's gone. Inflation soars again. And so all that handiwork of saying, you know, there's a way to get out of this, be careful, went evaporated, and the inflation eventually rose to more than 100% per year, which is pretty high, although I've dealt with countries in thousands of percent per year. But it was sufficiently high that the Argentines said in this election, we don't want to hear anything about any standard politician. We want something completely new. And the incoming president, uh, promised something completely new, specifically to adopt the dollar. And uh, it's probably not going to happen because quickly they backtrack. We don't even have dollars. We can't uh, tie uh, our future to a currency in which we have no reserves. We couldn't back the banking system and so forth. I've not spoken with the new government, although I know the incoming finance minister quite well. Um, I plan to speak with them. The, the long and the short of it is this is just chronic crisis. So I wouldn't draw too much uh, about general facts from Argentina, because basically almost any time between 1823 and 2023, you could have found the country in crisis. And I've dealt with all, already in my career uh, with a number of, uh, of presidents of Argentina. And they don't have the the internal political capacity to overcome this yet. So all of this is to say uh, Argentina endlessly fascinating, a little bit bizarre. Uh, hopefully they'll get out of it this time. What's interesting now geopolitically is that the outgoing government had joined the BRICS. Uh, and that is a good thing. Uh, and an important thing for Argentina because it brings Argentina and the next door giant Brazil together, which is very good for South America, very important diplomatically, very important geopolitically. The incoming government has said, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with China because Malay is being portrayed as an ardent uh, Americanist. So on the American side of this block politics. My message to the Argentines is, look, China is your, your major customer. Uh, don't be dumb. Uh, don't go with the U.S. in this sense. You know, trade with the U.S., trade with China. Don't get into this crazy mentality of one side or another. And by the way, in this world today, if you have to choose one side or another, I wouldn't go with the American side. Every time a country sides with the United States these days, it ends up in disaster like Ukraine because the U.S. is a fading uh, empire. Uh, it, it can't sustain all its promises, not even close. It can't even keep its own public institutions functioning anymore. So my message to the Argentines is don't you don't have to choose sides. Just just be nice. But don't break relations with China, for heaven's sake. Join the BRICS. It's a good thing to do. And maybe within the BRICS efforts this year, which are very important efforts mm -hmm. to create non-dollar payments, there'll be mm -hmm. something in it for Argentina. That I'm going to try to explain to them. 
uh, there really is some good news for Argentina in the fact that it won't just be the dollar in the world, that there will be alternative payments. And Argentina shouldn't close itself off from what's going to be an important new force in, in, in international monetary economics. Mm. That's all very interesting because one of the things that I noticed, which has not been mentioned, I think, widely, is that Putin, of course, has just been to the UAE and he's just been to the Saudi Arabia. And he came with a very, very big and very strong delegation of people. And I noticed that one of the people who was there was, of course, Nabulina, who is the central bank chair. And um, both Saudi Arabia... I didn't realise she was on, on yeah, the trip, but that is, a, that is a very yeah, interesting it's very part. You, uh, it, yeah. it was interesting because you, there was a... She was... You, the, I don't think it was announced, but there was a list of... You saw the picture of all the people in Riyadh, and they were all shaking hands, and one of the people who was there and who shook the hands was none other than Nabulina. So she was there. And, um, of course, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are both joining the BRICS in a few weeks. So is Iran. The new Iranian, the, the Iranian president has just been to Moscow. He's had discussions there with, with Putin. There's just been this announcement of this free trade agreement. And then at the same time, Putin gave this speech at an investment forum run by VTP. And... A disproportionate amount of that discussion was about the financial architecture. He was saying that, you know, in fact, that that seemed to be the most important thing. That you know, the the finance you, you you need to get the financial architecture right domestically in order to move forward. But he was also talking about the new financial architecture, and he said some very interesting things about how the existing financial architecture, which is Western-based, is becoming outdated and obsolescent, also in a technological sense. So you have Nabulina there in all of these meetings, and she's presumably talking about all of these matters. She seems to be very interested in them. And she's talking with the big oil producers. And Iran is also a big oil producer. And at the same time, you have all these discussions what, from Putin about financial systems. And you know, the, I wonder whether the, this adds up. Yeah, the, the, the trip was absolutely fascinating, mm. incredibly skillful of Putin uh, at this moment. And it, it reflects actually three major geopolitical points, all, I think, rather uh, ingeniously brought together. W one of them is uh, OPEC plus, of, of course. Uh, OPEC plus Russia constitutes uh, an enormous part of the hydrocarbons uh, uh, market uh, of the world. And they they do a lot of important business together in this, in, in managing uh, the uh, oil and gas market. So that's uh, one part of the trip. Uh, another part of the trip is clearly regional, uh, which is the integration of Russia with Central Asia, uh, with the Arabian Peninsula, uh, with the the, uh, the Middle East more generally. Uh, and you look at the map and uh, between Russia, China, Central Asia, uh, Arabia, uh, th this is building, and of course, India is a member of, of the BRICS. This is really building most of Eurasia uh, into an integrated geopolitical and economic uh, huge part of the world. And so very, very deft in that regard. Also, a basic principle of economics, a fundamental principle is neighbors should get along. They trade well with each other. Uh, they share ecosystems with each other. And that's the principle that Putin is following uh, because uh, Iran is a neighbor. Uh, the Middle East is a neighbor. This is very smart. And then the third dimension, in addition to the oil and the neighborhood, is, of course, the BRICS. And the BRICS started out as the five, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It had already reached uh, a, uh, an output level measured at what we call purchasing power prices or at international prices larger than the G7. That is geopolitically and economically notable. But now the five are being joined by six more, presumably Argentina. That's uh, the new addition in, in uh, South America. 
uh, Egypt and Ethiopia in Africa and Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates uh, and uh, and uh, Iran uh, in uh, in the in the Middle East region. Now you add the six to the original five, you have thirty seven percent of world output according to the IMF uh, purchasing power uh, data, compared to twenty nine to thirty percent for the G seven. Uh, this is a different world, uh, and and uh, and. This is really powerful. <clears throat> and what the BRICS are discussing uh, this year in particular is exactly this financial architecture. And of course, that was greatly hastened by the absolutely uh, awful and mistaken U.S. policies on the dollar. Uh, so the U.S. has what uh, Charles de Gaulle, already President de Gaulle, and 50 years ago, 60 years ago, called the exorbitant privilege, uh, which is that the dollar is used uh, for about 60 percent of international transactions of all kinds. Uh, the way you denominate a contract, the way you pay to settle a contract, the way you uh, governments hold their foreign exchange reserves. So on all three major dimensions of international currency, the dollar predominates. Not exclusively, but uh, overwhelming. Uh, and uh, that gives the U.S. a huge advantage. You don't run out of the dollar to what? To the dollar. <laughs> and so it's not like Argentina where everyone's sitting on the edge as the U.S. debt reaches 100% of GDP. If Argentine debt ever came close to 100% of GDP, they'd be out the door in a moment. But with the U.S. being the currency of the world, Nobody flees the dollar. So that's the exorbitant privilege that you get to borrow. You can pump up the money supply. You get some inflation, but you don't get what Argentina or just about any other emerging economy would get. But the U.S. just couldn't leave good enough alone. It had to weaponize the dollar. And this has really been it's become an addiction. The U.S. generally is addicted to regime change. The U.S. generally is addicted to a foreign policy that says, I don't like you. I want to replace you. Uh, send in the CIA or send in an army. But we get to choose who your government is. Now, this is uh, absolutely disastrous foreign policy, in my view, uh, completely against the U.N. Charter, completely against international law. But that's the core. And the U.S. figured out 10 or 15 years ago that it could use the dollar as a foreign policy weapon. And the main way that it uses it is in a very crude way, which is to say, one day, your dollars are now our dollars. Thank you. Your dollars means, literally means, you have accounts in U.S. banks or U.S. controlled banks. That's what a dollar is, in, in effect, uh, M2 definition of a dollar. Um, so you're holding dollar accounts in institutions that we control. And what the U.S. has come to do increasingly frequently is freeze the money of other countries, of their central banks, no less, of their state enterprises. And the United States did this with Venezuela. Absolutely absurd. But one day Trump and his minions got the idea that they will declare who's the real president of Venezuela, not the actual president of Venezuela, but they named someone from the Venezuelan parliament as president and said, OK, that guy's president. That actually lasted for a few years. And you could see the power of the United States. It's like the emperor with no clothes. Uh, Oh, about 40 countries said, oh, now Mr. Guaido is president, not Mr. Maduro, who's actually president. So you could see a measure of the U.S. influence uh, that other countries would follow this nonsense. But in the process, they said, Mr. Maduro is no longer president because we said so. And he has no longer has access to the foreign exchange reserves of the country. We give that to this other one. Well, this is absolutely crazy. Even the IMF couldn't, I mean, not, I shouldn't say even the IMF, the IMF couldn't figure this out. It doesn't have the gumption to say to the United States, you know, that's ridiculous. 
say, oh, no, we have a big issue. Who really controls the foreign exchange reserves? So these games went on for years. Of course, with Russia, it's much more serious than that. The United States froze its estimated $300 billion of Russian financial assets. That's a lot of money, by the way. That's That was the trick that was going to bring Russia to its knees. It didn't do so. But that's what they thought. You know, we've, we've got Putin cornered. We've got Russia cornered. We'll bring them to their knees by freezing their assets and locking them out of the U.S. banking system, the so-called SWIFT settlement system. Well, Russia quickly figured out, very cleverly, we could trade with China and Redmond B. We could trade with India and rupees, a little bit shakier on that front. We can find other ways to transact. And to make a, a maybe a short story long as I have, <laughs> this year Russia is the leader of the BRICS. The uh, BRICS summit will be in Kazan next October, I believe it is. And so Russia chairs the process and it's chairing an expert group to come up with non-dollar payments. This is smart. <laughs> and I kept telling my friends in the U.S. government, don't abuse the dollar. It's going to go away. Who? Because in monetary economics, the first thing you teach is the real economy is the real thing, what you produce, what the factories are. There are many ways to make a settlement, even barter, of course, but there are many currencies you can use. So don't think that your currency brings another country to its knees because the other country's economy is the real economy, the ability to produce steel, the ability to produce weapons or artillery, the ability to produce automobiles or chips or whatever it is, or oil. And the United States misunderstood that, but really abused the privilege of the dollar. And the dollar will absolutely lose its role in centrality in the international payment system in the coming decade. You know, in monetary economics, just to, to mention, all my colleagues look at history and say it's a long, slow decline of a currency. And, and the most famous case is the British pound, which used to be the core of the international monetary and financial system in the 19th century until basically the Great Depression. But uh, the fact is, and so they say, look, the pound hung in there even after Germany was larger, even after the United States was larger, even after Britain's share of the world economy had declined, London remained the center of the international system. But it's not going to happen the same way with the dollar because it's just too easy technologically to do things differently. And so we will have at least an international renminbi at a minimum playing a big role. And we could have a kind of BRICS, a BRICS, uh, if not central bank, a BRICS monetary uh, mm -hmm. fund uh, that uh, serves the role of giving liquidity and credits among the BRICS countries in a way which will mean a, a non-dollar settlement system. Mm -hmm. Professor Sachs, just a few things. As a as a person in Britain, I can say that the long decline of sterling after Britain lost its uh, hegemonic position in the world economy was an absolute disaster for Britain. You yes. would not want to go through that process again. And um, by the way, it's quite interesting yeah. just to say the way it manifested. Of course, World War One was awful. Uh, the return to gold in nineteen twenty six overvalued to Britain uh, in the world economy. And uh, Keynes wrote one of his most famous mm -hmm. essays in 1926 called The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill, who happened to be the chancellor of the exchequer in 1926 that put this mistake into place. The 1930s were the Great Depression, World War II, of course, devastating. And the point is, by the end of World War II, Britain had basically gone deeply into debt, even with its own colonies, which became independent countries. And so Britain never quite got out of debtor status again. Uh, and it was a very, very heavy, long, painful period. Britain 
the center of the world going to the new International Monetary Fund for an emergency loan. I mean, unthinkable. But, you know, the United States, can you imagine going to the IMF for a loan? It's not impossible. This is exactly uh, what you're uh, what you're referring to. Absolutely. I remember it. I was I was in London, of course, when it happened. I can remember the chancellor turning back at the airport. He had to rush off to Washington to raise funds. And of course, the fact that we had this currency, which was still an, an international currency, was doing immense damage to the British domestic economy, which I think people don't understand. So in some ways, it might actually be better for the United States, I would have thought, to go through it quickly than have it you know, drawn out in the way that it was with Britain. I'm not by the way, saying that's going to happen, yeah. and I'm not making those points. But anyway, that's that's what, that's what I wanted to say. But it's a long process. It's a long agony. It's not uh, based on the British experience. So you know, we we will have non-dollar payments in the BRICS. That's uh, clearly high on the mind, not only of President Putin, obviously, uh, but also President Lula, who every day asks. And he's the chair of the G20 this year, as well as being a, 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 a BRICS member. Why are we dealing with Russia in dollars, for heaven's sake? And he's very sensible, very logical. Uh, and uh, we will move to new payments arrangements and they will do just fine. Thank you. That will be the real lesson.